Okay, welcome back. In today's video, we're going to look at mark to market PL. Now, if you recall from my first video, what is product control? Hopefully, you record that when I spoke about the income statement or the profit and loss report, you hopefully remember that I mentioned that we first decompose that PL, so break it up into its underlying components like new trades, mark to market, funding, fees, and other. But then for the mark to market PL, we do something further. And that is we attribute the PL into its underlying drivers. Now, before we look at attribution PL, I want to touch upon what is mark to market PL. Now, the secrets in its name essentially, we're just looking at fair value through income statement portfolios. And we're looking at the change in existing positions or the change in the value of existing positions. So for instance, if you have a interest rate swap or a futures contract, which isn't a new trade, we're looking at what the change in the value of that trade is from one day to the next. So that's a combination of both the, the risk inherent in the trade and the change in the market prices. So that's what market uh, or mark to market is. Now, for mark to market PL, it's important that we ring fence it or isolate this PL and report it separately. And there's four reasons which we do that. Number one, you may have heard of the term VAR or value at risk. And essentially, this is a model uh, which the bank uses to quantify, given how much risk that they're carrying, and what are the probable losses associated with that risk? Okay, so we need to be able to compare our mark to market PL back to our VAR results. So number two, by isolating the mark to market PL, we can compare it back to a risk-based PL estimate or risk tie as it's also called. And number three, it enables us to check on the trader strategy. So let's say that you're doing the controlling for a fixed income desk and you see some equity or commodity risk flowing through their mark to market report. So that's odd. Uh, that would trigger an investigation and, and perhaps the trade is being booked incorrectly and hopefully the desk aren't engaging commodity or equity uh, trading risk. Number four, the fourth and final reason why we isolate mark to market penal is because it informs senior management and regulators how much profit and loss is being driven by proprietary trading or risk taking. So they're the four reasons why we isolate mark to market penal. Now, the way that we validate our mark to market PL are twofold. Number one, we run attribution reports. And number two, we run a risk based PL estimate, which we can compare back to that mark to market attribution report. Now, when it comes to attribution, there's three methods that I'm aware of for running attribution. Number one, the waterfall method. And you'll see here in this slide, essentially what the waterfall method is doing is it's taking the opening portfolio so our opening risk it's not considering new or amended trades and it's shifting the portfolio from the start of the day or like the end of the prior day to the close of the new business day so you can see here the portfolio shifted by time uh, then fx spot rates are updated from the prior day to today then interest rates are updated credit curves are updated volatilities etc so these pricing inputs are updated one after the other, and you'll see an accumulated MPV on the side of that slide. So this explains, or this usually explains, all the P and L, and it tells you what uh, what risk and changes in pricing inputs have impacted the desk mark to market P and L. Now the second method that I'm aware of is called the bump and reset method. For the waterfall method, we updated the pricing inputs one after the other, and it resulted in a cumulative NPV. So after FX, we updated rates, and so it was shifted incrementally. With bump and reset, we bump a pricing input, then we reset it, then we bump the next pricing input, and then we reset it, and so on and so forth. So we take the PL scores individually. Now, when you add up all those PL scores, they may not agree to the closing NPV. And this is particularly the case for portfolios with optionality. So where they have some gamma or vulgar, so second order derivatives. So where this is the case, you need to have your system capture the PL impact 
from those gamma impacts. Now, the third market attribution report that I'm familiar with is using a risk-based PL estimate. And some more advanced systems these days are able to generate reports based upon the opening portfolio's risk parameters. So it's, it's delta, it's vega, it's theta, and even some second order derivatives like gamma or volga, and apply those risk sensitivities against the change in the pricing inputs. So whether the desk are carrying an FX delta or an interest rate delta, you apply the changes in the FX rates or the uh, yield curves against those risk exposures. By doing that, you come up with an estimated marked market PL, which essentially should explain most of the marked market PL. Similar to bump and reset, where it may not explain the whole PL, is where there is second order derivatives or PL impact from that, which hasn't been programmed into the attribution model. Now, aside from attribution, the other way we validate marked market PL is by using a risk based PL estimate. So it's important to do this where your marked market attribution system does not use the risk sensitivities or parameters of the portfolio to generate a marked market PL estimate. So this could be done manually, for instance, by the product or financial controller. Obviously, this is an ideal. It's better if it's plugged and programmed into the underlying product system. Finally, where you have financial assets and liabilities where their transaction currency does not agree to the functional currency of your entity, it's going to ge generate FX revaluation. So that's another component of your attribution which you need to quantify and report. Now, I mentioned earlier, one of the reasons we reinvent Smart Market p &L is because of VAR. So VAR is a useful measure. It looks at what the probable losses are given the bank's uh, existing risk positions. So most banks use a VAR with a confidence level of 99%. And what that tells us is that 99% of the time, whatever VAR is telling us, could be $10 million, uh, your marked market or your hypothetical p &L shouldn't exceed that, that $10 million. So if we do have marked market p &L that does exceed VAR more than 1% of the time, so more than three days a year, uh, it tells the regulators that they can't really trust the bank's internal model. Now, for product or financial controllers, it's important that you're only reporting the marked market PL, so the PL from existing positions uh, into the marked market PL category. You don't want to taint it with anything else. Uh, because if you do, it could result in punitive capital charges for the bank. This has been a brief introduction into marked market PL and the controls we run over this PL component. If you found it helpful, hit the like button, subscribe to the channel and reach out to me for further training.